welcome everyone to our uh, latest webinar uh, aimed at providing information to uh, help industry professionals uh, get through this health crisis. I'm Jeremy Yowie, also the Vice President of Communications, and uh, today we've uh, got a great presentation lined up uh, focused on returning back to the office. Um, since title and sell the settlement industry is deemed essential business, most of uh, everyone out there, their operations didn't really close their office, so it isn't really about reopening, but uh, rather um, making sure you all have the proper policies and procedures in place to help keep everyone safe, safe and healthy. Um, today's content definitely uh, of interest. We had over 800 people register, so uh, I'm happy for the turnout. Uh, before starting, I need to touch on a uh, a few housekeeping items. A, uh, a copy of today's uh, presentation can be downloaded from the uh, Go to Webinar handout section. Uh, you also find a few other handouts there, including the uh, CDC's uh, COVID back sheet and um, an infographic with tips to help uh, protect your employees' health. Uh, everyone's lines are muted for the presentation. If you have any any questions, uh, submit them to the questions box. We'll hold a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded. Uh, you'll, you'll have a link to the recording. Uh, probably tomorrow. You can always find all of all 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 of our webinars archived on the office website at alta.org forward slash webinars. Uh, I do need to give a, a quick shout out to SoftPro and uh, thank them for sponsoring today's webinar. And uh, let me introduce uh, today's speakers. Uh, moderate, moderating our discussion today, we have ALTA President Mary O'Donnell. Mary is Chief Executive Officer of West Coreland Title Insurance Company. And also, uh, from the title industry, we have Craig Haskins. Uh, Craig is Chief Operating Officer of Nightberry Title Group. And also joining us uh, from the law firm Ballard Spar, we have attorneys Shannon Farmer and Elliot Griffin. Shannon is a partner at the law at the firm and it represents public and private employer, employers in a broad range of labor and employment, employment matters. Uh, Elliot is an associate in the firm's litigation department, uh, also focusing on labor and employment issues. And with that, Mary, I will uh, turn the conversation over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. You know, over the last several months, we have all been faced with a barrage of executive orders addressing a variety of things from stay in place orders to essential business definitions and boy just so much more as governors and regulators amend and release some orders while implementing new orders around plans for reopening businesses as employers were often confronted with a lack of uniformity and very often inconsistent guidance the landscape can be really confusing even for an employer in a single location. But for those operating across states or even across county lines, keeping track of what is and is not required is just quite an endeavor. If you're curious about what to do or what not to do, if you have concerns about what your liability may be, if an employee or a customer gets sick, if you've got questions about the risks that you might be undertaking, about screening and testing employees and others that enter the office, then you are at the right webinar. This is the right one for you. We have two wonderful expert attorneys from the law firm of Ballard Spa who are going to dig into some of these and other matters around employment, health policy, operational issues for companies as we face the transition back into fully staffing offices. So we're really excited about it. Um, in addition, Craig Haskins and I will share how our respective companies are approaching the opening or the increased staffing of our offices and all the new workforce protocols that have been brought on by COVID-19. It is definitely a brave new world out there, so lots to think about. Shannon, Elliot, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. And we're really excited to be here. Uh, we have a number of resources that we've posted on our COVID-19 Resource Center on our website. Uh, we've done now two webinars, uh, a total of two and a half hours on return to work issues. If you want more detail on these issues, uh, there's also guidelines and a checklist and alerts on a variety of topics from FFCRA, PPP, all of those things. And you can reach them on our website there. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elliot to get us started on leadership and planning. 
Great. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so as you prepare to reopen or increase your operations, um, you want to start that conversation by putting together a group of stakeholders within your workplace who are going to be responsible for mapping out your plan. Um, I'd like to say that this leadership team should have all critical functions of your business represented. You want diversity of thought and perspective um, as, as you think through these issues. So um, categories like HR and operations and finance um, should be represented as part of your leadership team. Um, and should conduct a, a risk assessment and, and walk through the workplace as your employees view it from start to finish. Um, are they, are you, do you have a lot of employees taking public transportation? If you're a tenant in a commercial office building, um, how are your employees getting in and out of the building? How are they getting to the bathrooms um, and doing that in a, in a manner that mitigates any risk of exposure to COVID-19? Um, and they should create their reopening plan, which we'll talk about um, in just a second. Um, and just keep in mind that you're doing all of this to protect the health and safety of your employees. So they should also regularly monitor any updates from federal and state authorities or um, even your county authorities, as Mary said in the outset, um, that are all have different guidelines and regulations for and are establishing the, the do's and don'ts for how you can reopen the workplace. So next is your reopening plan. Um, you want to think through your health and safety mitigation measures. And in a minute, Shannon will discuss more of those and the regulations that are um, propounded by some federal bodies. And your COVID-19 response plan. Um, we don't want to think about it, but the reality is you, uh, you could have an employee that tests positive. And what are the next steps once you find out that an employee is exhibiting symptoms or um, test pos positive for COVID? Um, how are you going to notify the empl other employees, their coworkers who they may have come in contact with? Um, and how are you going to clean and sanitize the area with which they may have been in at, at work? Um, there are leave issues, which Shannon will also discuss later. We have the Families First Coronavirus Act to be aware of, um, in addition to some state and local laws, which may um, allow employees additional leave in addition to whatever um, you provide them as an employer. Um, and the transition from partial remote to in-person operations, you also want to think through, um, which can be sticky for many reasons. Folks could still have um, kids at home. Schools have been closed. Um, I imagine that several camps are not planning a re to reopen. So while you might be ready to welcome people back, that could present some issues for employees. Um, and if you've laid off any employees, how are you um, deciding who and if to recall them? Um, there are a number of things you should think through there and making sure you're doing that in an equitable way. Um, and then um, how are you kind of tying a bow on, on all of this planning and making sure it's prepared to roll out and how are you communicating that with employees? Um, that should, should also be a part of your thought process. And the last thing, which um, may seem a bit counterintuitive, is if we see a, a spike in COVID cases, if um, states are forced to reinstitute shelter in place orders, what's going to be your game plan? Um, and if you have to transition back to um, maybe a partial operation again, where some employees are, are still at home. The, the policies and protocols, um, which I alluded to on the previous slide, I, I would first review your current employee handbook, see what policies you have in place. Is there anything you need to remind your employees about? Um, or is there anything you may want to temporarily amend to address the, the new workplace procedures? Um, keep it in mind things like social distancing or, or hand washing, making sure that employees have um, the space and access to wash their hands probably more than they ever have before. Um, think through if you are um, going to have a face covering policy, whether that is mandatory or optional, um, scheduling breaks or staggering shifts, maybe so only part of the workforce is actually in the office each day. 
um, if you're going to do any screening and testing. Um, I believe all of the speakers will be able to share some um, personal anecdotes about that a little later um, and just walk through whether you want to do temperature screening on site. Do you want to have um, or do you want to require employees actually uh, take a COVID test before they're allowed to come back to work. Um, there's a number of things you can think through there. And of course, some employees might have reasons why they can't or won't return to work, which we'll discuss in more detail later. Um, but you might have some accommodation request um, or, or leave request as a part of that. Um, and as I said at the outset, your leadership team has to be responsible for constantly monitoring CDC and OSHA guidance um, and guidance from your respective state authorities um, and prepare to adjust your game plan as those gui guidelines change, um, which is regularly. Um, I know that several of you probably have offices um, across the country. So having a workplace coordinator on site is something we also recommend. Um, and that person should have an open door policy for employees to bring their concerns to them. Um, if employees suspect another employee is exhibiting symptoms and maybe isn't being honest about it, um, you, you want that you want that person to be able to address those issues accordingly. Um, and there's the media and PR aspect. I think before COVID, there were lots of businesses that probably did not find themselves particularly newsworthy, but now your reopened plan and how you're bringing employees back to work has become extremely newsworthy. So you want to think about um, how you will deal with press inquiries if they come. And your internal PR strategy is equally important. How are you communicating with employees um, and how are you transparent with them about the, all of the steps you are, you are taking to prioritize their health and safety in, in the workplace? So the last thing I wanna to touch on for this section um, are, is liability mitigation in your relevant agreements. You may have um, staffing agencies and you want to work with them to assess what their requirements for staff will be um, and what your requirements will be for employees entering or anyone entering your workplace for that for matter. Um, and lease agreements, particularly if you're an, a tenant um, in an office building that has a lot of common spaces you want to um, look at those agreements and determine what is your landlord responsible for um, and what measures they are instituting in place. I know that in our office in Philadelphia, um, we are in a big office building. There's one floor that all tenants have access to. Um, it's my hideout spot for lunch. It's a lot of people's hideout spot for lunch. Um, and I imagine those places, those types of areas um, might cease to exist in the future or will look very different. Um, so that's also something you want to determine if you are doing on-site screening or testing, that would also be another agreement that um, you're entering into. And you want to ensure that you have adequate space either in your building, which is something you, you might need to discuss with your landlord, or if you're gonna um, conduct the screening in, within your specific office space. Um, in your insurance agreements, which is probably a, a top concern for a lot of you, um, you may get claimed workers' compensation claims um, from employees claiming that they were contracted COVID in the workplace. Um, and in some states that, that may fall under um, workers' comp. And then your general liability insurance. You also want to review your coverage there and assess um, what's covered for vendors or customers or any visitors that may be entering your workspace um, who may claim that they contracted COVID in your office. Um, so I know health and safety is something I mentioned several times over the past few minutes, so I'm going to pass it to Shannon who's going to talk about that in some more detail. Great, thank you so much. And keep in mind when you're thinking about these contracts that you want to keep in mind that uh, when you, for particularly for staffing agencies, you often are going to be considered a joint employer with them. So you want to make sure that your staffing agency is taking all appropriate steps to mitigate, making sure they have appropriate workers' compensation coverage. Because the reality is, if your staffing agency messes up, you're getting sued too. 
Um, also, just you know, keep in mind that you know these these lease agreements. While you've got workers' compensation bar in most states, is going to bar employees from suing you if they um, contract COVID in the workplace. We've seen a number of cases already, although we think many of them might wind up getting disposed of on the workers' comp bar. That will not necessarily mean that they can't, for example, bring a suit against the landlord if they believe that they contracted it because of unsafe practices. So you just want to be keeping that in mind as well, being communication with your landlord. We know that a lot of operators, for example, of high-rise buildings are talking about putting restrictions on elevators um, and limiting the number of people so you can socially distance in elevators. People are talking about, you know, only people who work in the same company can ride the elevator at the same time. I have to admit, if our office ever reopens, I'm trying to picture how that would work in a 52-story building. Um, but, you know, those are the, some of the things that are going on. So you want to be in communication with your landlord um, about all of those issues. So what is the liability? You know, one of the questions we're getting a lot from clients is, what's my liability um, if employees get sick, right? Because people are trying to decide how far to go. And it's a somewhat complicated question. So as I mentioned, we have seen several long wrongful death lawsuits that have been filed already against employers uh, by, by the estates of employees claiming that the employers were um, negligently um, allowing people to work without safety measures. So there's a case filed against Walmart. Um, there's a case filed here in our area, in Phil the Philadelphia area, um, against about a um, employee of a meatpacking JBS. Um, and those have been where there's been physical on-person operations. Now, whether those cases go anywhere or whether they wind up being barred by workers' compensation uh, statute in most states, there are other areas of liability beyond just those. And that also relates to an employer's obligations under OSHA. So the general OSHA standard is the, there's sort of what's called the OSHA general duty clause. OSHA has not adopted specific standards related to COVID for most industries. There's actually pressure on OSHA to do so. That would be standards, which have an additional level of obligation, what they've done is they've put out guidance. Guidance is not the same thing as regulations or standards. Um, and the same thing, the CDC, what they've put out is guidance. So it's a difficult place for employers to be because for the most part, what we don't have is regulations that require employers to do things at the federal level. But what we have at the federal level with OSHA is what's called the general duty clause. And that is that you provide a workplace and you have the language here, free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. So if an employer violates that, they are subject to sanction under OSHA, which would include if somebody could prove or if somebody, you know, that a death resulted or other claims. So people can go and file complaints under this against OSHA. And OSHA has seen a gigantic spike apparently in complaints that have been filed where people are saying, my workplace is unsafe. And OSHA can come in and investigate and they can issue citations. Um, the amount of those is relatively small typically. Um, but we don't have specific standards. What OSHA has said as it relates to COVID, they've issued some guidance, but mostly what they've said is basically you should follow the CDC guidance. The other important thing here is that OSHA does provide protection and has whistleblower provisions if you have an employee who refuses to engage in dangerous work. And the standard is it has to both be subjectively and objectively dangerous. What that means is that the employee is, for, is afraid, but a reasonable employee would be as well. You go to the employer and complain, and the employer refuses to fix it. So for example, somebody says, you know, we should be able to have masks. And the employer says, no, we're not going to give you masks. And there's no time to correct it through enforcement channels. So this is the immediate, the employee on that day says, I'm not going to come into work unless you provide appropriate masks. Um, the, what that, then this gives a protection. You can't fire an employee for doing that under this OSHA standard. So the employee can then go to OSHA and get OSHA to investigate. But any time that somebody is complaining that the workplace conditions are unsafe, you want to be very careful about taking disciplinary action. You want to talk to your counsel and make sure that you're not creating a whistleblower claim under OSHA. And also keep in mind that many states have state whistleblower protections as well, which can have 
um, in those instances for whistleblowers, you can have orders that can get the person reinstated with back pay and often with fines and there can be other damages as well. So it can get pricey if you were to take those kinds of actions. And the CDC has issued guidance, as I mentioned, that OSHA has incorporated. So if we go to the next slide, um, there has been, this is not something that has been issued uh, uniformly, but these are engineering and administrative controls that are contained in guidance that was put out for the meatpacking industry. Um, and a lot of them are generally applicable and are worth looking at. Now, they're not going to apply in every workplace, but these are the kinds of things that are being recommended for in-person operations that you address in your response plan for. So what are you doing about cleaning and disinfection, right? Are you going to have increased cleaning? How does that look like? Does that mean having an additional vendor come in? Um, partition. So some states are actually requiring, for example, in, in supermarkets, that you have workplace partitions with plexiglass or reconfiguring workspaces to provide for social distancing or other kinds of physical social distancing protocols. Limiting in-person interactions, what's referred to as cohorting. So the idea is that you always have the same group of people working together in an area so that if somebody come, becomes ill, you only have to quarantine that cell and then you can have somebody else as opposed to having free movement around a workplace where then you have to potentially quarantine everybody. Schedule changes, so staggered shifts, the same things, creating teams. So trying to limit people's exposure to one another, permitting continued remote work wherever possible, um, additional time clocks, just little things like that, you know, places where people tend to congregate. Um, some people are talking about single file movement, that you only allow people to walk in one direction so you don't have people passing in close quarters in hallways or things like that. Creating additional breaks so people can wash their hands, but also staggering breaks so you don't have people gathering at all at lunchtime um, in break rooms or things like that. As Elliot mentioned, in our office, there's, you know, one place where people gather, whether that is going to be permitted um, when our part of the country actually allows reopening at all. Um, looking at sick time and leave policies, there's been a lot of concern about not creating disincentives for people to come to work when they're sick or to stay home when they're sick. So you don't want to have leave policies or attendance policies where, you know, people might feel like they have a choice between coming to work sick and getting fired. So there's been a lot of encouragement of looking at those policies, whether that winds up being additional paid leave or just relaxing attendance policies. And then what are you doing about face coverings, masks of some kind? Many states are requiring these gloves. Are there other kinds of PP? So those are all things that you should be looking at in terms of your policies in your workplace. Let's go to the next slide and talk more about this idea of PPE. So what does this mean? So that can be, it can be most commonly what we're talking about in this circumstance, and especially for your industry, we're really mostly talking about masks and potentially gloves, right? We're not talking about, um, you know, gowns and face shields and things like that. So do you provide it? Do you have to provide it? That's going to be a state or county law question. The CDC is not requiring it. They're recommending it. Um, keep in mind that if you require masks, then under um, OSHA, that actually becomes a uh, respiratory program, and you actually have to follow the OSHA rules for a respiratory program, which involves accommodation. You don't have to do fit testing the way you would do it if you were requiring you know, respirators like you might in manufacturing, but it is still an issue if it's required versus if it's voluntary and they're made available, but many states are requiring that people, that employers require it, so you might have to follow those, but you need to take a look at that. Um, what else are you providing? Gloves, are you requiring them? How do you get them? You know, some employers are struggling with figuring that out. Are you doing surgical masks or class masks enough? The CDC has said, you know, in most industries that are not healthcare, cloth masks are fine. Um, most of the time, if you're requiring it, you're going to be required to provide it um, because it's a required safety measure. How much do you need? How often should it be? you know, refreshed if they're doing paper surgical masks or things like that. Um, who are you requiring it of? Is this going to be everyone who comes into your workspace? Are you allowing visitors and customers to come in? Are you requiring it? You might have seen that there's been a number of cases around the country now 
where in where in places that have started to reopen, there's been customers who have been unhappy about being told they had to wear a mask. And there's been a few shootings, which is horrific. Um, but, you know, that's an issue if you're allowing customers to come in. What about your vendors? Um, and what do you do if you say we're going to require this, but then you can't find enough? And what does that mean? So you want to think about before you adopt a policy that says, here's what we're going to require, or here's what you should do. And then you realize that you can't provide enough. So you need to be realistic and thinking about what it is you're going to require. Um, and then if people are bringing their own, how do you make sure that it's acceptable, right? If you're saying, okay, masks are required, is just a bandana enough? Are you doing inspections? How are you handling that? Are you telling people you know, what they have to do in terms of washing, things like that? And what do you do when people require exemptions, which happens, right? So you have a mask requirement and somebody says, I can't wear the mask because it triggers my asthma. What are you doing? about that. Do you have to accommodate that? Maybe. Um, you have to go through the process. You could determine if you've decided that masks are required. You could decide that it's a direct threat to allow somebody, and this is under the Americans with Disabilities Act, that it's a direct threat to allow somebody to come into the workplace with an uncovered face. And some of that's just going to depend. Do you have people who are high risk in your workplace? Um, or if masks are not being required, then that's not going to be an issue. I'm religious accommodations. I actually had this case. Um, this is at a group home. The workers at a group home for people with disabilities. So this is a high risk population. It's not masks are not required by law right now for this for the workers, but the company is requiring them to protect the residents. Um, and somebody said, I won't wear a mask. And the um, the reason was um, that's not I won't cover my face because that's not how God made me. And so then we had to work through the religious accommodation aspects of that um, and, you know, trying to work with the employee. Well, okay, what if only when you're interacting with the individuals, but if they're sleeping or if you're on a break, you don't have to. And, and ultimately, what do you do in that circumstance? So you have to go through the interactive process to determine if there's an accommodation. Let's go on to the next slide. And then what are you doing about screening and testing? So um, as Elliot mentioned, are you going to require actual testing before people return to work? Some companies are looking at that, um, perhaps even as a one-time test so that they know that everyone who's coming back in, at least as of that time, is negative. And how are you going to do that? Are you going to tell people to go to their doctors, available testing? Are you going to hire a vendor? So I have some clients who are looking at getting vendors now that there's do at home tests where there's a vendor who's going to mail a test kit to everybody. People take the samples, they send them back to the vendor, the vendor will test them and the company will just get a report of this is who's, you know, this is who's cleared to return. Um, there are some companies and, and particularly in higher risk industries are saying, should we be testing more frequently? Now the testing is becoming more available. Screening, what does that mean? Is that just temperature screening? Are you doing it on site or are you telling people they have to do it for themselves? And what do they have to report to you if they are? Um, so are you requiring them to log it? So we have a client who's actually developing a platform. So they do, um, it's a, a medical client a company. And so they're actually developing a platform where employees will log in every day and they'll have to take their temperature and report, answer a number of questions. And then the company will have its doctors basically tell, you know, their clients, yes, this person is able to return or not. And then, you know, they maintain the record. So thinking about that, what's going to be reported? How are you going to keep a record of being who was being reported? Or are you doing it at the door? I would say a lot of employers outside of, let's say, large companies that already have medical facilities on site and things like that, a lot are just going to have people do self-screening. And some states require it now. You have to have people check their temperature every day before they come to work. But you still have to decide on things like what are you having them report? Um, and are you having them report their temperature to you? Or is it just, you know, screen and stay home? And some of that depends on your individual states and what the state safer at home or reopening orders are requiring. What about people coming into the workplace, your vendors, visitors? Are you allowing visitors, customers? Are you screening them? And how are you going to do it as we discuss? One of the questions that people ask me is if you do workplace screening either at home or having people stand in a line at the office to do it, um, do you have to pay people for that time for your non-exempt people? Um, generally under federal law, I think the answer is probably gonna turn out to be no. 
um, because of the way that federal law looks at what's called um, things that are preliminary and post-liminary, what a good lawyer word, activities, um, as opposed to those things that are what are called integral and indispensable to the work. Um, but state laws are somewhat different. So there's been a lot of cases before COVID about things like people going through security checks. And some states have found that that is compensable time. Um, so people have to be paid going through, you know, Apple stores and things like that, getting their bag searched. Will they apply the same thing? And then what is going to happen if people do have symptoms? What's your protocol going to be for when you return people to work? Um, we're recommending that you follow the CDC guidelines. And so that's going to be important on keeping on top of what that is. And then record keeping and confidentiality. So if you do have records of people's medical, you need to follow the ADA rules about confidentiality, which means there are separate files, not in personnel files, and access is limited to those on a need to know basis. But you may also have an obligation. These could be OSHA records of exposure. It means you may have to retain them for up to five years. So that's going to be another thing. And actually, since we wrote these slides just yesterday, um, OSHA changed its guidance on what employers are obligated to do if there's a positive test. Now you have to investigate, most employers have to investigate and try and determine if it's a work-related exposure because it then may have to be recorded on your OSHA log. So that just changed yesterday, check that out. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Elliot to talk about what happens when people do have symptoms. Thanks, Shannon. So if you screen and it turns out that employees do have symptoms or maybe an employee becomes ill while they're at work, the CDC guidance recommends that you should immediately separate um, that employee from others and send them home. Um, and they should not be permitted to return to work until they've met the CDC's um, criteria to discontinue home isolation. Um, and those guidelines and criteria have changed even over the past couple of weeks. So that's also why it's really important for you to have a team who is tasked with staying abreast of, of these changes. Um, according to what they have labeled the symptom-based strategy, uh, employees should stay at home until at least 10 days have passed since their symptoms first appeared and three days since recovery. So their fever has um, reduced to normal levels without them taking Tylenol every hour, um, that type of thing. Um, the CDC also advises that employers do not need to request a doctor's note or a COVID test for employees to return to work. Um, and the relevant or maybe most relevant guidelines from the CDCs as it pertains to your, your business um, is accessible on the CDC website and um, I believe in Alta's COVID Resource Center as well. Uh, so as you reconfigure the, the workplace, you may also want to consider um, some additional signs and, and posters. The CDC and OSHA both offer these for free downloads on their website in several languages, um, reminding employees to socially distance or um, wash hands or even about what to uh, look for in terms of the signs of COVID. Um, the Department of Labor also requires that a, a poster advising employees of their rights under the Families First Coronavirus Act. Um, and you can find that on the DOL website. It's also um, on our, available on our resource center on the Ballard website. Um, so now let's get um, dig down a little more on the workforce issues that you might run into as you are making the decision about remote versus in-person work. Um, explore if you should continue to offer remote work um, to a subset of employees or maybe take a phased in approach where only a portion of employees are in the workplace um, and whether it will be voluntary or mandatory to return to work. Are there some tasks that you just need people in the office to, to complete? Um, and if you are continuing to allow remote work in any form or fashion, um, you should uh, employ a remote work policy. I know many employers were forced into this um, bifurcated period where some employees are at home, some are still returning to the office um, very quickly and maybe didn't take all of the steps that you would normally take um, if you were allowing employees to work from home. 
So now's the time to develop a full formal remote work policy um, and consider um, things like data security. Are, are employees taking confidential information home? And how are you um, protecting your customer information? Um, reimbursement for certain expenses, depending on what states you're in um, or your respective policies, you may um, be reimbursing for additional equipment the employee needs at home or um, even internet. Um, tracking the work time for non-exempt employees. Are you tracking every hour or are you just designating that they're working eight hours a day and they'll contact you um, if they work over that and if you putting that agreement in force if that's the um, policy that you decide to go with. Um, and now that you have been teleworking in some, it, either in full or in part for the past few months, um, people may ask for that as an accommodation. Uh, maybe they are high risk for um, if they contract COVID, um, or maybe they just have a lot of anxiety about returning to work. So, and those are all things that you will um, need to explore. And, and Shannon will talk about that process a little bit more in detail. And um, somewhat of what I alluded to initially is that you should be transparent with employees, um, being transparent about everything you're doing to protect their, their safety um, and mitigate the risk of COVID-19 in the workplace uh, is really important. And be prepared to um, address the accommodation issue, um, any changes to your leave policies. If you have barred any business travel or um, customer or client interaction over the past month, um, how are you revising or reeling back that those restrictions at all uh, is something you should be prepared to discuss in your initial communication with, with employees. Um, and of course, any changes to the benefit plan or um, any respective bonuses that those things might have come into play um, as employees have been away from the office. Um, but of course you can do all of that and still some employees will say, there's no way I'm coming back to the office. So Shannon's gonna discuss some more about how you um, deal with that issue. Great, thank you. So what we're gonna finish up on talking about today is these issues about you're trying to resume in-person work and what do you do um, if there are people who return, what are you doing about your high risk employees? And then also just a few wage and hour issues where there are changes in how people are being treated or what the work they've been doing. So we are seeing a lot of people who don't want to return to work. And this was true for employers who never stopped in person operations because people may be afraid of contracting the disease at work or during their commute. We also have people who are high risk because of an underlying health condition or they have a high risk family member. They may have child care issues. And we've also got the reality that for some people who haven't been working at all, the unemployment benefits in place right now with the $600 supplement through the end of July pay more for low wage employees than working does. And so people may not want to return because they're actually going to take a pay cut. So how do we deal with these situations? It depends on whether the reason that they're giving has legal protection. So a general fear about contracting COVID at work or during their compute is not going to be legally protected. However, if it rises to the level of an anxiety disorder, it might be. Somebody who has a health condition, it's possible that it makes them protected under the Family and Medical Leave Act if you are of a size where that is applicable to you. In addition, these position, some of these, um, somebody with a health condition, a family member with a health condition or child care issues may fall under the family's first coronavirus response act, the FSCRA, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and what do you do with the child care issue? Again, might be FSCRA um, or that might fall under, any of these might also fall under general leave policy. So our general approach to dealing with this is first, let's determine whether there's legal protection, right? Is there a legal protection for this person to not return to work? Either an accommodation under the ADA, which could be continued telework, or they've got some sort of leave entitlement. Um, the person who just wants to not come back because they don't want to give up the unemployment benefits, the federal government has been very clear with the states that that is not okay because ultimately that extra $600 is federal money. They put out new guidance again yesterday telling the states you have to police fraud on this. 
So many states have come out and said, employers, you need to report if people refer refuse to return to work and they've you've offered them the return. Now, some of these might be considered good reasons and it might be okay. So if someone doesn't have childcare, for example, under the CARES Act, they may be permitted to stay out, but somebody can't just say, I want to make more money on unemployment. So just keeping that in mind. Let's go on and talk about the leave issues now. So we've got the FFCRA, which we'll talk about in just one second. Again, if you have more than 50 employees within a 75 mile radius, you may be covered by the FMLA. You have state and local leave laws, and keep in mind that many localities have expanded their existing leave laws. So that's true in New Jersey and Philadelphia and Los Angeles and San Francisco, where they've adopted broader policies, either because new leave or because they've taken their existing paid leave laws and said, hey, this all applies to corona-related absences, including childcare. What about your policies? What do you grant under your policies? Keep in mind that you may have attendance policies that were very lax or policies for requesting leave that were very lax that you may need to actually change during this if you feel like they're being taken advantage of. So some employers have adopted special policies about people requesting leave in advance. And then we're going to talk in a second about high-risk employees on the ADA. So let's move on to just talk about the FFCRA. This is the, uh, if we can go to the next slide, the FFCRA um, is, was enacted in March it, for leaves that occur between April 1st and December 31st. It provides this paid leave. It is ultimately eventually paid by the federal government. It applies to employers with less than 500 employees. And basically, there's two forms of leave. There's this emergency paid sick leave, which is up to 80 hours paid at either 100% or two-thirds pay, depending on what the reason is. And then there's this public health emergency expansion of the FMLA up to 12 weeks. The first two weeks are unpaid. The rest is paid at two-thirds pay. So the EPSL covers a variety of reasons. Basically, if the employee has to quarantine for themselves um, because a doctor has told them or a public health order, if the employee is taking care of a family member who had to quarantine or an individual, they actually don't have to be related. It could be like a roommate even. Um, if the employee has childcare issues, um, those are the, the basic reasons. So if you send somebody home because they have a fever, for example, and they have to quarantine for two weeks, that's going to be EPSL. They'll get 100% of pay. Um, if somebody's doctor says, you know, it's not safe for you to be working and you should self-isolate, that's EPSL, two weeks of pay at that point. Now, if it's child care, they can get up to the 12 weeks at two-thirds pay. Notice that even if you are not covered by the FMLA, you may be covered and you're going generally to be covered by these laws because there's no minimum number of employees, although there are certain rules for businesses with fewer than 50 employees. You can choose to exempt, to basically make a declaration that a granting this leave um, might threaten the viability of the business and there's specific certification that you have to make. So these have different maximum dollar caps, but basically you pay it and then you're reimbursed by the federal government through a tax credit. Um, but the thing to remember is the 12 weeks of the extended FMLA is only for the lack of child care and the employee has to be um, the only person who is available to care for the child. So it can't just be, I want to be home with my kid. Let's go on to the next one. As I mentioned, state and local, um, you do have a number of these provisions already, so don't forget to double check. And then let's go on to talk about these high-risk employees and the ADA. This is coming up on the next slide in two different ways. One is that employees are saying that they are high-risk and don't want to come to work. If we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. And the other is where you have employers who may say, I don't want somebody in the workplace because they know that they are high risk. Um, so what you have to look at is what is a reasonable accommodation if the employee is requesting it. If somebody just says, I have diabetes and I can't come into the workplace, is indefinitely let them work remotely or indefinite leave, is that going to be a reasonable accommodation? Because if, if this isn't going to change, let's say, until there's a vaccine, it's essentially indefinite leave. Now, indefinite remote work, is that a reasonable accommodation? Maybe. We know indefinite leave is not under the case law pre-existing, but the EEOC's guidance suggests that you should try to work with employees or try to see if they can work in areas that might lead to less exposure. They haven't come out and said, 
you have to indefinitely let people work at home. But if they can perform their job from home, you might have to even under existing law. So keep that in mind. And then if you're trying to exclude somebody, the direct threat analysis cannot be just, well, this person is over 65 or this person has this. You have to really evaluate um, the workplace and determine if there really is a specific safety threat. You can't just make assumptions based on somebody's age or a medical condition generally. And there, again, there's EEOC guidance on this that they have been updating as well, and you should look at that. The final thing I want to touch on on the next slide is just two potential issues of wage and hour law. One is that there are a number of companies where due to change, staffing shortages, working more leanly during this crisis, or because of changes in how work is being done, you may have employees who are exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act doing non-exempt work more frequently. And so the question is, does this mean now that they're going to lose their exemption from the overtime rules? You should know that there is an emergency uh, exception under the FLSA. It usually deals with things like if you have a labor strike or there's a blizzard and you have, you know, a manager who's shoveling snow. So they're meant to get at short-term disruptions in the workplace. But if we have something where you've decided to cut your workforce, let's say, on a longer-term basis, and now you're going to be having, you know, people who you treat as exempt managers, let's say, do more line work you really could bring this into threat. So you wanna make, make sure that you're still having anybody you're treating exempt. Their primary duty is still doing the exempt work and you wanna look at that and keep in mind that in some states, it's actually a percentage of time um, and some states are very strict. At the federal level, it's a primary duty test, but some states treat that differently. And then there are our employers who, because they cut people's hours or did temporary furloughs or partial furloughs, they have converted exempt employees to non-exempt because they couldn't afford to continue to pay them full salaries. If you've done that, keep that in mind, your communication to get people back to exempt. Um, you wanna make sure that you're doing that and uh, you know any notice of pay changes in compliance with state law because some states have very specific rules about how much time you have to give people of notice of things like pay changes. So just keep that in mind. And with that, we're gonna turn it back over to Mary and Craig. Hey, thank you so much. That was just incredible. Um, so much good information. I mean, there's so much to think about. So thank you both uh, for your insight into the compliance and the liability issues that we in the title and settlement industry really need to be thinking about. You know, we all spend a lot of time trying to think about how to safely do what we do, but there are so many ancillary issues that we really do need to think about. So thank you again. It was a terrific presentation. Uh, Craig and I are actually going to spend a little time discussing how our companies have practically been trying to implement some of these uh, issues and think through them. Um, and so, Craig, I know you um, operate in a handful of states, and uh, I know a lot of your offices have been partially staffed. Um, how are you approaching transitioning other people back to the office and how do you deal with checking and adapting to all of the different protocols in all the different jurisdictions? How, what are you guys working on? Well, after listening to those two for a while, I might have to redo our plan now. So, uh, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> that was very interesting. No, so we've, uh, we announced our plan to our staff the other day. Our states are mostly opening now. Um, we're going to uh, take the phase approach like they mentioned. We're basically not changing right now. We're offering our employees. It's the number one call we've had for the last, I'd say, week and a half as some of our states have been reopening is, do I have to come back? When do I have to come back? And all of that. Our, our staff's been incredibly effective from home. We've, we have about 200 people working exclusively from home and about the other 200 working uh, hybrid home and office uh, combination. Um, it's worked. So we're not going to change that right now. We're not rushing to bring everyone back. So we're deciding, can you remain effective from home? If so, great. You stay at home until uh, we go into another phase. Um, if we need some space in the office to maintain social distancing, like if everyone was back in a couple of our offices, it'd be pretty uh, jammed up in there. As you know, back in, you know, back in the day, you know, March of 2020, uh, density in the office was kind of a fun thing and and sort of that's sort of fallen out of favor. So if we need the space to maintain so, uh, safe distancing, we're going to have some uh, folks uh, stay at home as well. Of course, those with special medical conditions, 
uh, those with childcare, we're not rushing any of those folks back to the office. Um, like I said, the, the, the number one thing for us at Nightberry is it's worked. Um, we're minimizing essential, or I should say non-essential meetings uh, that can't be done over a Zoom call or one of these. Um, no more hugging realtors when you leave a closing room. I had to, that's a joke, but I couldn't resist. And minimizing in-person sales calls, our sales team has done a pretty good job of um, figuring out other ways to reach out and engage our customers. So those are just a few things that we've done. That's really great. I mean, there's always so much to think about. And uh, like you, you know, we operate in a lot of states. We have a lot of uh, offices around the country. And, and we've sort of taken that same approach of, uh, we, sort of call, we call it office optional approach. And, um, you know, it's been interesting to watch um, as we've talked to some of our staff. We did a town hall the other day, virtual town hall, obviously, um, to talk about the uh, re- we call it the reoccupying of part of the offices. Uh, restaffing seems like you're replacing people, so we're not doing that. Right? And, um, but one of the things that we found really interesting is um, how many of our people want to know what somebody else is doing. It's almost like not just a fear of you know the disease itself, but will it be the same? And you know, will the atmosphere be the same? And if everybody else is staying home, then maybe I don't want to come in. It's been really interesting to you know, hear that sort of dialogue. And I think the thing we've found the most is, and I think Elliot, you mentioned this, is communication has just been the absolute key. Um, one of the, all the items you talked about in, ter in terms of temperature taking and, you know, the extra cleaning and masks, you get some great insight to think about, like Craig, I'm gonna go back and relook at some of the things we've been thinking about. Um, we've thought very much about social distancing when it comes to conference rooms uh, so we're removing chairs from some of our conference rooms so that they're more spread out putting capacity signs on saying no more than four people no more than six people uh, we've elected to just not open the break rooms for the first round uh, give people other options but you know just not go down that road at this time um, and i think one of the other things on communications that i wanted to share was uh we wanted to be sure that the employees knew that if one of their managers chooses to come back to the office, they shouldn't feel any sort of peer pressure that they need to come back because their manager's there. Um, and on the other side, if the staff want to come back and the manager doesn't, we want the manager to not feel that peer pressure. So I think that's one of the things we've been working really hard on is just totally open communication. And we have gotten a lot more effective at being at home, that, that's for sure. Um, you know, on those changes, uh, you know, Craig, uh, when you think about things you've had to adjust, especially I think about, you know, for your operation where you've got customers coming in and, you know, you've got realtors coming in, what are some of the big things that you've had to adjust to try and, you know, keep people safe and, and how was the implementation of some of those changes? Um, well, I mean, it, it, the, the first couple of weeks, it was a little shaky. We we're trying to find our way just like everyone else, but, um, we're 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 sort of we're we're trying to make the closers and the customers that come to the office very comfortable. Uh, most of the title folks can do their work from home, and that's where that's provided some safe distancing to make sure the essential folks like the closing personnel uh, can feel a little safer at the office. Same same thing with the uh, with the customers. And I think we're going to also offer some type of a shift work. Um, maybe you're in the office Monday, Wednesday, and Friday this week, or for a few weeks, or for a month, or whatever it is, and then the next, you know, then you're Tuesday and Thursday at home, or something like that. So we're giving flexibility to all 50 or 60 of our offices to kind of make it work for themselves. Our number one thing is we need our staff. Uh, well, that's our asset. I mean, we okay, we have some computers and desks and filing cabinets, but the staff's the asset. So if they're not comfortable uh, coming to work, then we don't really have a business, do we? That's right. That's right. And, you know, I think one thing uh, for those of us who have offices strewn around the country is it's definitely not a one size fits all approach. Um, mm -hmm. You know, every state is a little different than even within counties, it's very different. So, you know, we have some uh, overarching things uh, on the safety side, you know, the, obviously the hand washing and uh, the face coverings. But otherwise, we're sort of letting our local managers, you know, have a lot of uh, leeway in determining how they want to repopulate their offices. And, um, you know, I know Elliot and Shannon are from a Philadelphia area up there, so your area is completely different than it is up down here in Florida for sure, right? Um, so I think just sort of managing, you know, what's happening in the different areas um, and making sure that we're listening um, to the staff in terms of, you know, what's happening. Um, there is a lot of fear out there. Um, you know, I find our employees are in 
sort of two camps, those that they feel really good most days about something and then they watch the news and then they're really frightened of everything again. Um, or on the other side, you know, one thing I see is people who say, just please let me get out of the house. Um, so it, it's sort of a little across the board and I, I wondered what kind of things and uh, thoughts and concerns are you hearing from your employees? The same. Um, we've got we've got staff that are looking forward to coming back. Um, but the, the, the earlier, the personal protective equipment, that was a uh, some good points you made in the uh, presentation earlier. Our staff is uh, that's the number two question. Uh, when I come back, what do I what do I need to know? What's different? Um, you guys mentioned that the break rooms, uh, you know, having everyone go to lunch at noon doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, we share some pretty cool. I mean, we spent a lot of money building out some of our break rooms, which will be partially occupied, but we'll figure this out. Um, as far as the mask and everything, we, we've just uh, we've decided to let our staff make that uh, decision on their own. So we've recommended. Um, we've recommended uh, face coverings when the six foot spacing isn't uh, possible, uh, but um, we've ordered we've ordered some um, protective equipment for our staff if they need it. Otherwise, we're giving them the option if they want to wear their own or if they feel some more comfortable with something else. So uh, that's when do I have to come back and what do I do when I get back? Because I haven't been to the office in two months. What's it like now? Well, first of all, <laughs> half the plants are dead, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so. I, I think I think that that's all that's all uh, very relevant, and I think we're all going to be uh, working on this for a long time to come. And I think the thing I tell all staff is, this is what we're doing today. Uh, Don't mean it's what we'll be doing a week from now or a month from now. Uh, like you said, in the good old days of March 2020, which seems like a hundred years ago, we were all doing things very differently. So um, thank you to uh, Shannon Elliott and thank you, Craig. Jeremy, I'm going to turn it back to you um, in case anybody listening to the webinar has any uh, questions. Yeah, you know, thank you, everyone. Uh, definitely a learning process as everyone adapts to uh, this uh, day and age with COVID. Um, just a reminder, we, we've got a couple of minutes. If you have any questions, uh, submit them in the questions box and we'll uh, push them to the uh, speakers. Um, one question came in about um, face masks and, and while a company may have protocol, what, what can they do if a vendor or a customer comes, at, comes in without a, a state required mask? This might be a question for Ellie or Shannon. Sure. So um, what a lot of companies are doing, particularly in states where masks are required is actually having somebody, whether it's the receptionist or whoever it is, who's basically tasked with saying, you know, you have to have a mask to enter these premises. Um, it's a challenging position to be in, and that's exactly the circumstance where, you know, we have had um, some incidents, unfortunately, particularly in retail, where a lot of states are requiring, like supermarkets and things like that, that people wear masks where you know staff have been in the position of telling customers that they have to wear masks and customers have become very angry and there's unfortunately been a few shootings which is horrific um that people are being placed in in that position so you know i think people are taking different views and a lot of it depends on whether you're in a state where you're required to do it um you know where in states where it's not required where it's recommended I think some people are still doing it or saying, look, you know, we really want to protect, we want to respect our employees and protect them and protect you. Please put this on. Um, in states where it's required, you know, the problem that the employer is in is that you could face potential fines or shutdown orders from the state, depending on how strict your state is being, if they were to, you know, come in and see that or if an employee were to call and complain and say there's people in our workplace and this rule isn't being followed. So it puts people in a very difficult position. And I think a lot of it is depending on whether this is a voluntary policy or whether this is a state requirement. But I would say most employers are at least trying to suggest to people like, while you're on our premises, please do this if that's the way that that employer has gone. The question is, are you really telling people you have to get out? And, and it's sometimes a little bit different whether it's a client perhaps or whether it's a, you know, a vendor. <laughs> Where they can like okay can you leave it at the door then um and you can't really necessarily do that with a client but it's very difficult to balance those issues i have a client who's uh struggling with the fact that they they have salespeople and um, some of their clients are reopening more quickly than they are including internationally and want to resume in-person meetings where the company does not and now what do you do you know their policy is oh everyone has to be socially distant and wear masks and all those things but if you're going if the client says we want this salesperson at this meeting or you're not going to get this account 
And what do you tell your salespeople to do? So they're really been struggling with what to do. And you can't really require your client when you're going into their office to make everybody wear masks. And those are just, you know, challenges of the business reality versus trying to keep employees safe. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, lots of questions ask, ask, actually just asking if the webinar is being recorded. Yes. You'll get a link uh, tomorrow to the recording and uh, you can always find all of our uh, recordings on the website at ALTA.org forward slash webinars. Um, we are at the top of the hour. I know we only asked one question. Um, maybe throw out one more. Um, question about uh, temperature testing uh, is it effective if there's asthmatic uh, infection any advice on what to do there uh, i knew that question was going to come up i yeah. knew it and and let me just jump in on as a title agent with a zillion offices we we are uh we're requiring our staff to self uh self-screen daily before leaving their house to come to the office so we did buy a few of those temperature guns. I just think it seems odd to stand at the front door as everyone comes in and zapping them in their head and then announcing their, it wouldn't be like that, but we just have decided just to let, you know, look, self-screen before you come to the office. If you got a temperature, you're not feeling well, or if you're symptomatic on any of the, you know, known uh, symptoms of this, then uh, stay home. Greg, we did the same thing, but I had a question, if I wouldn't mind, uh, for Shannon and Elliot, because something you said during the uh, presentation I thought was interesting on this point is, um, is there an obligation on behalf of the employer when we're saying, you know, self, self, you know, take a self temperature before you come to work? Like, do we actually have to track that they in fact have done that, or is it sort of an honor system? It depends on your state. In many states, you, because you're not required to do it or you're not required to keep a record of it, you wouldn't have to. In some states where the temperature screening of employees daily is actually required by the state order, um, you know, I think I would want at least there to be something that employees do, even if they don't report the number, you'd want to have them verify that they did it in some way, whether that's an email, whether that's a sign, something, because if the state were to come in and say, especially if you wind up with a cluster of infection, God forbid, you know, you don't want the state coming in and saying, well, that's because you weren't following the screening protocols. Many states are giving employers the choice, even where they require temperature screening of letting people self-screen. Some are requiring on-site screening, particularly after there's been a positive test, like Pennsylvania, for example, if you've had a positive test in the workplace or a known positive, you then have to do in-person screening on site for a period of time. Um, so it depends on your state a little bit, but if you are taking the temperatures, you know, you probably do want to keep, you might want to consider whether you're keeping track in some way, particularly again, where it's required by law. But otherwise I think just having people confirm whether that's like when they, if they sign in on the sign in sheet, you just sort of say, like, I confirm, you know, there's a checkbox, like, I confirm I went through my self screening or something like that, so that you can know that you've done everything you can if you were to have an OSHA complaint or a, something under state law. All right. Good question, Mary. Uh, actually, a quick question on, on where people are getting supplies. Uh, Murray said, you know, office basics. Yeah, one gallon bottles of hand sanitizers, reasonable prices, pump bottles, funnels are available on Amazon. Minimum order, you believe, is four gallons. You know, Craig or Mary, any, any uh, uh, suggestions on where you're getting your orders from, or is it local? Or I'm not going to tell anyone that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, honestly, I don't know. I, I could find out, but I'm not the guy that does that. So we actually. Uh, very early on worked with our normal office supplier who supplies all our office equipment, um, you know, from pens, papers, the whole bit. And we found that they actually had uh, a really, you know, good, consistent supply. Um, I know as we're starting to reopen, we've been able to, uh, you know, pretty much get what we need to have sitting in the offices ready for when people come back. So I think sometimes you don't think about just your normal office supply company. Uh, but they actually, many of those have really geared up and gotten ready. So I, I would probably start with them if I was uh, if I was uh, out there. All right. Uh, thank you, Mary. All right. Uh, we'll uh, wrap up here. Uh, great information. Hopefully it was informative and uh, you guys can start. Uh, if you haven't started developing a plan, you know, this will be a good starting point. Uh, you can also go to Alta's website, alta.org forward slash coronavirus there. We have a lot, lots of additional resources. Shannon also uh, mentioned uh, the resource on Ballard Spar's website. Um, 
people are wondering about specific requirements, state requirements, the uh, there's a link under under the Operation Healthy Office tab there, and um, their resource provided by the Chamber of Commerce. They've done a great job detailing what each state is doing as far as their reopening plan. So I encourage you to check that out. I uh, also just wanted to give a quick mention of our Alta Good Deeds campaign. Uh, we launched this a couple months ago, highlighting everything that Alta members are doing you know, to deliver for uh, people and organizations in their local communities. Uh, the response has been pretty inspirational, seeing that what everyone's doing is, as far as from making masks, donating you know money to local restaurants, or just helping you know people in need. Uh, so you can share your information if you're doing doing things in your in your community as well. You can email communications at alta.org, or you can you can post on our social media at uh, on, on Facebook using hashtag #50s. And uh, with that, uh, that will bring us to the, the conclusion of uh, today's uh, presentation. We just need to thank SoftPro once again for uh, sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.